Okay, now let's move on to chapter 10, which discusses population growth and regulation. So, um, uh, we talked in the previous uh, chapter about how, or in the first chapter actually, some of the maxims of college, and that is that populations can't just keep on growing and growing. Um, <clears throat> when we look at the human population, we see that it... Uh, lately at least, has been growing and growing. It shows nicely this typical kind of growth curve that you sometimes see. For much of our history, we were relatively few of us, but recently it's shot up quite a bit. Now, because of that, because of that relatively large population, we're now over <coughs> 7 billion of us, we um, are having more and more of an impact on uh, the landscape. This abstract art here, it's actually not art, but a satellite image of um, an area in Kansas that is intensively being farmed. It used to be prairie, but now um, all these circles and squares, what are they? They're basically agricultural fields, and the circles in particular are ones that are irrigated by these systems that sort of will rotate in a circle as they water the field. And so you get this... this uh, mixture of these rectangular and circular agricultural fields um, necessary to feed this large population. All right, so the main thing in this first section is we want to talk about life tables. And life tables are a way of um, sort of uh, looking at the dynamics of the population numerically and um, keeping track of that population, that species, through time. So here, for example, is this type of grass, and here's the life table for it. And so we've got age, number of individuals at any given age, survival rate, survivorship, and fecundity. So age starts with zero. That is, at time zero, there are a certain number of individuals born, and in this case, it was 843. And then you've got the subsequent time periods, and you can see this actually is not years, but each time interval represents three months. So this would be three, six, nine, twelve, uh, etc. <clears throat> okay, so in this study, they were following this population, and at time zero, there were 843 individuals alive. To the next, through the next time period, 722 individuals survived. And so that gave us, for that time interval, from 0 to 1, a survivorship of 0.856, or 85% more or less. Survivorship is 1 at that point because everyone is born, everyone is present. But now survivorship to the next stage is essentially the fraction of 722 to 843, again, 8.56. All right, so now in the next stage, we go from 722 to 527. What is survivorship for that stage? Well, it's 527 divided by 722, which gives us approximately a 73% survivorship rate. Now, overall survivorship, though, is still measured as the current number divided by the original starting point. And we can see that now we have 527 out of 843 that are still surviving, or about 62.5%. Okay, so you can do that for each time period. And um, again, find out what's the probability of surviving from the beginning to an end of a particular stage. And what's the overall change in survivorship as we go from our original number of individuals, and then those individuals basically drop off. Uh, as time goes by. Fecundity is basically a fancy way of saying fertility, or it's essentially the um, reproductive output of the individuals in any given time period. And so you can see these guys in their second year reach sort of their maximum fertility, and then it drops off after that. <clears throat> okay, so that's those are the basic components of a life table.
Here is a life table for females in the United States, somewhat older data, but 2005, probably not too far off from what it would be today. And so here we have different stages. We have 0, 1, and then they st start going in five-year intervals. And of course, everyone is born, so at the very beginning, survivorship is 1. But then, oh, and notice this does not have the survival rate, but it just has survivorship. And so, essentially, 99.4% of the individuals survive to stage 1, or age 1. About 99.3 to age 5. So you can see there's very little drop-off there. And survivorship stays pretty high, pretty high up through the 50s beginning to decline somewhat, decline somewhat, but again, still pretty high, and it's really not till the very older ages when survivorship starts to drop significantly. Survivorship, I'm sorry, fecundity, of course, uh, juveniles don't have offspring, older women do not have offspring, so basically from the years, eight or the ages 15 to 50 is where you have uh, individuals, females giving birth to individuals, and it's at about age 30 more or less where you get your maximum fertility. Another one thing we didn't see up on this life table, but we see on this one is expected number of years of life remaining. So you can see individuals who are born live on average about 80 years, and it stays fairly high in terms of the number of years, but it, of course it begins to drop off because there is some mortality. And so by the age of um, 50, if you survive to 50, you can expect to live another 32 years. But of course, once you start getting really up there in age, by the time you're 90, you might only you're expected to live only another 4.7 years. Um, all right, so this survivorship can be used to develop what we call a survivorship curve. And it just shows, again, over time, the proportion of individuals that are surviving to particular stages. Of course, it'll start at 100, but then it starts to drop off but very slowly, particularly with U.S. females, as we see. Because, again, at those early stages, you have really high survivorship. And it's not till later that it begins to drop off. And notice that this only goes to age 50. And over here, it only drops down to survivorship of 40. But if you compare that to Gambia, this uh, African nation, you can see that there's a considerable difference. And that is there's really high mortality at the early stages, the juvenile stages for females. Once they get to age 5, survivorship does not decline nearly as much. Um, but you can see childhood mortality is much higher in Gambia than the United States um, compromising overall survivorship. Um, and it's a little funny in that it kind of depends on when individuals are born as to how well they survive later in life. And that's a, a curious finding. Um, you can perhaps think about why that might be. So again, we can develop these survivorship curves. They come in three main types, type 1, type 2, and type 3. We see that U.S. females, and for the most part males, they're not all that different, demonstrate a what we call a type 1 survivorship curve. Most of the individuals that are born survive the juvenile stages, and mortality really kicks in much later in life. Some populations, some species can have a type 2 curve, which is basically just a straight line down, which basically means that you pretty much have constant mortality at any given stage. The average mortality is the same at every stage. You can also have a type 3 curve, which really drops off at the beginning, which means there is really high mortality of juveniles in that kind of um, population or species. Now, once they get past the juvenile stages, they'll, they'll live to their uh, full lifespan for the most part. And here you can see we just have relative terms um, because these can encompass species that live 
on average a long time or a short time. It's just giving you a look at the difference between survivorship of these different types of organisms. Again, people might be here. Certain types of plants might be here, and I think that's what we have next, yes. So here are the doll sheep. Um, I just gave a title mountain goat. They, you can see they pretty much have a type 1 curve. Juveniles survive pretty well. This uh, species of bird has a relatively constant type 2, and this plant has a really typical class type 3, and that of the seeds produced, most of them do not survive to produce a plant. They perish or eaten, whatever. But those that do germinate seem to do well, although there is, of course, some drop-off in that type 3. All right, another way of characterizing populations are um, what we call these age structure pyramids. And they give you a graphical look at a population. On the y-axis here, we have different age groups. And when we do this with people, they're usually clumped in groups of 5, um, 0 to 5, 6 to 10, 11 to 15, etc. And you put males on one side and females on the other. And you sometimes get this classic pyramid shape with other. This is uh, Nigeria and Africa. And you can see Japan has an interesting shape because it's not shaped like a pyramid. It's more like a cylinder. But it tapers at the bottom, which is a little curious. Um, they're always going to taper at the top because of the mortality of older individuals. But this bottom tapering is a little interesting. And let's think about that for a minute. So here, let's look at some of the characteristics of these two populations. It's got the basic size. Lifetime births per female. This is the fertility rate. And you can see that in Nigeria, it's quite high. That is, the typical female in Nigeria has about 5.7 kids. In Japan, it's only 1.4. Now, does this raise any red flags for you in terms of this Japanese population? If the typical female only has, on average, 1.4 kids, what does that mean for the growth of this population? Uh, a much younger population in Nigeria, 43% under age 15, only 13 in Japan. Um, not many old-timers in Nigeria, whereas there's a lot in Japan. Life expectancy, life is hard in Nigeria. People on average only live to be about 47, whereas in Japan, you can see they live to what we would call a ripe old age of 83 on average. And here's a good way of looking at sort of um, the status, the health status, health care system, quality of life in a country, infant mortality rate. You can see per thousand babies born, 75 of them in Nigeria will basically won't survive infancy whereas it's a small percentage that uh, die in Japan during infancy, only 2.6 per thousand. That's an extremely low number. This is pretty darn high. Um, I don't know exactly what it is, but I think the U.S. average is probably around 7 to 8. Still pretty low, but not, not nothing like Japan. Now look here. Projected population. Nigeria is expected to go from 158 to 3.26. Probably not too surprising based on all these babies they're having. As you can see, Japan is expected to shrink in size, again, because of these relatively few babies. On average, how many babies does a woman have to have to just keep the population at the same size? Now let's think about that. Um, Okay, I'm just about out of time. I can only do 15 minutes per video, so I'm at 14, so I'm going to stop right here. We'll pick up with these hypothetical life tables in the next video.